Hi, and welcome back to another installment of Geology One Processes and Products. My name is Renee Clary, and today we will investigate geologic time, or the time frame for the Earth, all 4.6 billion years of it. We said initially that we would discuss three themes of geology this semester and geologic time and uniformitarianism and all of the changes the Earth has undergone is one of the main themes in geology. So today we're going to investigate geologic time. Let's get started. When we investigate geologic time, we usually use two frames of reference. What's the difference between these two? Well, first off, we have relative age data, dating, and this places events in an order according to their positions in the rock record. We don't necessarily have an absolute date, such as 4.3 million years old for that rock layer, but we can tell whether or not it's older or younger than another rock layer. The other frame of reference is absolute age dating. This gives us the specific ages of rock units or events, and it's measured as years before the present. So we may say that a rock unit is 1.3 plus or minus 500,000 years old. What is the difference between these two? Imagine you walk into a high school reunion. You don't know the ages of the people present, but you can place them in a relative order, older to younger, on the basis of their graduation years. This would be relative age dating. If you know the birth dates of each individual, then you can assign an absolute age to each of them. So which reference frame do you think is most important? with the geologic time scale? That's a trick question because both are important. The geologic time scale is a human-made filing system. It started out as a relative scale and then the absolute ages were added later. New information becomes available, new data, and the geologic time scale is modified. Again, it's a human filing system. Here is one rendition of the geologic time scale. And if you look at the beginning of the Phanerozoic Eon, I've just circled that in red, um, that is listed as 542 million years before the present, or the Phanerozoic Eon began 542 million years ago. Um, let's look at an older time scale. This is about 10 years old and if you look the beginning of the Phanerozoic is listed as 570 million years ago. Again, this is a uh, this is a time scale that is a man-made and we adjust it when we find data that better fits what we're trying to convey. Take a good look also at the most modern era, the Cenozoic. Uh, the Quaternary has been debated for quite some time. The 2009 latest calling is that the Quaternary does in fact exist as a, um, as a period, um, but because it was denied as a period in 2004 by the International Stratigraphic Commission, expect there to be more debates on that as well. So please always use the most current version of the geologic time scale. Let's look at each of the dating methods in a little bit more detail. Relative age dating is based on the construct of uniformitarianism, or the present is the key to the past. We use present day processes to investigate the rock record with the assumption that the same processes operated in Earth's past. This was first proposed by James Hutton in 1788 in a paper, and sometimes James Hutton is given the credential as the father of modern geology. We have a, a strange way of doing history in the United States and Europe as well. We tend to want to call people the first or the founder when a lot of different individuals were involved. James Hutton may have proposed the ideas, but he, his works are very, very difficult to read. For example, have you ever sat during a talk, a lecture, and an hour later asked yourself, what was that about? 
hopefully not this lecture right now, but I think we've all been in the situation where we've heard someone speak for an hour and had no idea what the person was trying to convey. Fortunately for uniformitarianism and modern geology, Charles Lyell, who was a barrister or an attorney by training, took up James Hutton's ideas and published his own texts on them in the 1830s. And he is given the credit for furthering James Hutton's ideas. Now, interestingly, we use the term uniformitarianism, but it was not a term used by either Hutton or Lyle. When William Hewell reviewed one of Lyle's texts in the 1830s, he used the uniformitarian term as sort of a derogatory term. However, it stuck and it became standard usage for Hutton's proposal of deep time and the processes that operated essentially the same throughout Earth's history. This was directly in opposition to catastrophism, which was supported by Georges Cuvier, among others. Cuvier might sound familiar to you. He was a great French scientist and is often referenced as the father of comparative anatomy. He um, was an especially important scientist in vertebrate investigation. Now, uniformitarianism, like most things in science, was not immediately embraced by the scientists of the day. Several scientists were not convinced that this was the way that the Earth had operated throughout time. It especially flew in the face of the catastrophists who believed that great changes, such as a, Noa a Noachian deluge, were responsible for the changes we see in Earth. And it also flew in the face of those who proposed that all rocks had a sedimentary um, origin in the deep ocean basin. And Hutton proposed a molten origin for granite, which is correct, but this was very, very different from what was accepted at the time. How did scientists react? I love this scientific caricature. It was drawn by Henry Della Beach, who ended up being the first director of the British Geological Survey. Della Beach was not convinced because what Lyle was saying, the processes that operated in Earth's past are the same that operated today. This did not fit with what Della Beach was seeing out in the field. For example, look at that very broad U-shaped valley in this picture. What Lyle was saying was that that little bitty stream at the bottom of that big U-shaped valley was responsible for carving out that big U-shaped valley. Now Della Beach thought that was ridiculous and what he did he drew a picture of a nursemaid or a nanny with a little boy. The little boy is supposed to be William Buckland's son. Uh, William Buckland was the first reader in geology at Oxford University. And Della Beach said that the, the idea that that little bitty stream had carved out that big U-shaped valley was essentially the same as proposing that Della Beach's son had urinated and carved out that big valley. And the caption at the top is, bless the baby, what a valley he have a maid. Um, this was done in the 1830s, again, by Della Beach, and he was partially correct because we know now that that big U-shaped valley was not carved by running water, but by glaciers. So uh, this was done before Agassiz proposed glacial theory. There are six principles involved in relative age dating, and we will briefly cover each one. The principle of superposition states that the oldest layer is going to be on the bottom and the youngest rock layer will be on the top. And this makes sense because as sediments are deposited, they are deposited on top of each other. So after lithification takes place, the older deposited sediments will be on the bottom because they were deposited first. For example, here is a photograph and you will note that there are different beds different sedimentary beds, and the older beds are going to be at the bottom of the photograph, and younger beds move toward the top, the way the sediments were originally deposited. Another principle for relative age dating is that of original horizontality, and this states that sediments are originally deposited horizontally. Of course, there are a few slight exceptions when we talk about cross-bedding, but in general, we mean that the sediments are deposited flat or horizontally. 
This is a great photograph and diagram that illustrates that. Um, look on the left hand side, you'll see different areas where the sediments are being deposited, different layers. And if you move to the middle block diagram on the left hand side, you will see that there has been uplift. The, um, the sea level has receded or the land has um, been uplifted and we see now that those original flat layers are in the shape of a mound or an anticline. Over time these layers are weathered so what ends up showing in the rock, layer, uh, rock record are these tilted rock layers and you can see a picture of those rock layers as they correspond to one of the limbs of that anticline over on the right hand side. Another principle of relative age dating is that of lateral continuity. Lateral continuity states that a layer, a sedimentary layer, will continue equally in all directions until it eventually pinches out. This, again, is sort of common sense because as a river deposits its sediments, it's not going to start depositing in, in one area and then say, whoops, I'm going to hold all my sediments for a while. Um, this isn't a good area to drop out sand or silt, so I'm just going to just hold out and oh, here we go. Now I'm going to start depositing again. Instead, what we do see is this layer of continuously deposited sediments until basically the sediments run out and the layer pinches out. Let me show you a diagram that probably explains that a little bit better. Um, up at the top you see a floor of the sedimentary basin and you see different layers there, different sediments that have been deposited. It looks like a shale and then a sand and then finally some more shale layers up on the top. And if you look very carefully in that top layer toward the letter A, you'll see that that sand layer is sort of pinching out amongst the shales. It was deposited continuously until basically the sediment source, uh, the sediments ran out. So the layer pinches out. However, if this layer, these layers are exposed at the Earth's surface and we have some weathering and erosion, what we may end up seeing is the, um, the picture, the block diagram in the bottom and you see what look like to be river channels that have cut through those layers. If you see that in the field, you can know that it wasn't deposited this way. In other words, we didn't have a shale and a sand lens and then whoops, the river stopped depositing and then all of a sudden, you know, starts depositing again and then stopped depositing. Instead, erosion has removed those continuous layers in, in areas. So lateral continuity states that we do have deposition, it does continue out in all directions until the layer will pinch out. Lateral continuity. Cross-cutting relationships this principle notes that if we have an igneous intrusion or perhaps a fault that cuts across existing rock layers, then that igneous intrusion or the fault has to be younger than the rock layers that it cuts across. And that makes sense as well because the rock layers are already in place before either the intrusion cuts across them or the fault breaks the rock layers. Here we go. Here's a photograph of a fault. It's cutting across the sedimentary layers. So by the principle of cross-cutting relationships, we know that the faulting occurred after the rock layers were there. We had deposition and lithification of those layers and then faulting occurred. So faulting would be the younger of the events. What if we see something like this? Well, in this diagram, we see different layers of rocks that are deposited down toward the bottom. It looks like the kind of grayish uh, shale layer. And then we had interruption. We had a limestone layer that was uh, being deposited. And now those two are offset. In other words, a fault has cut across. Uh, we can tell with the limestone layer that they've been offset. They are no longer continuously across. We have an igneous intrusion moving across the shale and the limestone and we have some more sediments on top. If we had to reconstruct this geologically we could say correctly that the shale layers 
the shale layer was deposited, then a limestone layer, then we have a, another shale layer, and faulting occurred after the layers were in place because it cuts across. Then we have an igneous intrusion which is younger than the fault because it obliterates part of that fault. Then it looks like we had an erosional surface at the top of the igneous intrusion and the shale layers. And then finally, if you look at letter E, those final sedimentary layers were deposited. So from oldest to youngest, we go from shale, limestone, shale, then faulting, then igneous intrusion, then weathering, then the deposition of new layers. The principle of inclusions will tell us that if we have rock fragments in a layer, the rock fragments are older than the layer in which they are incorporated. Now this can occur in a variety of ways. We have two block diagrams here, two cross sections, showing us some possibilities. Now, if you look at the top diagram, I have just circled um, a piece of what looks like lava that is incorporated in an upper layer. If you look at that lava flow, you can see a baked zone as well at the bottom of the lava flow, but not on top. So if we look at these inclusions of the lava in the upper layer, we can state correctly that after deposition of those bottom two layers, we had a lava flow on the surface and then after some erosion, weathering and erosion, we had deposition of those top layers because the layer on top of the lava flow incorporates pieces of the lava. Therefore, the layer on top is younger because the inclusions, the lava, are older. Now, what about igneous intrusions? Look at the bottom diagram. If you look at the lava in the bottom diagram, you can see baked zones on both the top and the bottom surfaces. So this was intruded, a concordant intrusion, and it was emplaced in country rock, and it also incorporated pieces of that country rock. Therefore, the country rock is older. The igneous intrusion here is actually younger than the rocks on top of it. Again, look at that baked zone on the top. That tells us everything. That tells us those rock layers were in place and were metamorphosed when this igneous intrusion um, was actually in place. And finally, our last principle is that of fossil succession. Fossil assemblages succeed one another in a regular and predictable order. Um, this is the work of William Smith, who was an English surveyor in 1815. Smith's story is chronicled in Simon Winchester's book, The Mount That Changed the World. Professor Hugh Torrens, who was formerly of Keele University, is considered to be the academic expert on Smith's life. And it was quite an interesting life. William Smith did the first geological map of a country, of England. Now, in order to use the principle of fossil succession, we rely heavily on index fossils or guide fossils. Well, what makes up a good guide fossil? It should be something that is geographically widespread. It doesn't help if the animal or plant lived in just a small isolated area because then it's only good in that small isolated area. Index fossils are organisms that existed for short geological time spans. Now that can be millions of years because we're talking about 4.6 billion years of Earth history, but anything that existed for 500 million years is not going to be a good index fossil. It just doesn't narrow down the period at which that animal lived or the plant lived. An index fossil should be easily identified. It doesn't really help us if it takes um, SEM investigation to determine whether or not the, um, the fossil that we find is different from 10,000 others that it looks like. And it should also be abundant. 
Using the principle of fossil succession, we can look at different fossils and correlate rock layers from one place to another. If you look at the bottom layer, we can see that we have a crinoid and it looks like a, a trilobite um, that are found in certain layers. And above that, we have a younger layer, remember, superposition, and we have a different species of trilobite and a rugose coral, and it looks like a brachiopod. So the grouping of fossils, the fossil assemblages, allow us to trace these, um, these rock layers from one place to another. And we have a regular succession. So that trilobite that lived down in the lower rock uh, sequence when uh, these sediments were being deposited uh, does not now appear on top of uh, the uppermost layer that you see in the diagram. In other words, that one went extinct. It's no longer found in those upper layers. We use assemblage zones, um, just like you saw in that diagram, these overlapping ranges of different fossils to more accurately date different, different rock layers. Um, note in this diagram we have something called lingula. It is an inarti inarticulate brachiopod and it's been around forever. <laughs> lingula is one of the long-term survivors, so in terms of a successful organisms, hey, lingula's there. Um, but it's not very good as far as helping us to pinpoint the age of a rock layer or when it was deposited, even relatively, because it's been around for so long. From uh, the lower Ordovician rock record, all the way through the, um, the recent times, or the Holocene. Now, a tripa is a great little um, brachiopod, and it's found only in upper Silurian rocks to lower Devonian rocks, and you can see its little range there. And at the bottom, we have um, Paradoxides, which is a, um, a trilobite, and it's found only in the Middle Cambrian. So these fossils, the, um, the brachiopod and the trilobite, are much better index fossils because they were around for a much shorter period of time. However, if we find, let's say, a rock body that contains both a tripa and lingula, we know that it had to be deposited in the upper Silurian to lower Devonian. Well, wait a minute, you might ask, lingula is found even today. Yes, but a tripa is not. So you have to look at the age that the two fossils have in common. So if lingula and a tripa are both found, the only time the rock could be deposited is in the late Ordovician to the, um, the early Devonian. Let me give you another example of that. Let's say we have fossils A, B, C, D, and E, and I've given you those fossil ranges um, when they're found in the rock record just as time one, time two, and time three. Now if I find a rock body with all of these fossils in it, and I know the ranges for the fossils when this organism lived, the way I determine the age of the rock body is to look at the time when all of the organisms would have been alive. And that's only in time two, the beginning of time two to the end of time two. So although E has this great range geologically, even though it's found in the rock layer, it doesn't mean the rock layer can be time three. It can't, not if all of these fossils are found. We have to look at this overlapping range. Unconformities are used in relative age dating. Um, unconformities are surfaces, and this is very important. Let me stress that. An unconformity is a surface. An unconformity represents geologic time that's not represented in the rock record. In other words, we can have times of non-deposition or erosion, and we have missing rock record for a certain period of time, a certain length of time. The actual time that's not represented in the rock record is called a hiatus. This is the time that's not represented. The surface is the unconformity. There are three basic types of unconformities. The first is a disconformity. A disconformity involves um, parallel sedimentary rocks. Again, only sedimentary rocks. We have a surface of erosion or non-deposition between beds that are parallel to each other. So this surface represents missing time. 
Let's take a look. Here we have different layers that have been deposited. Remember the oldest is on the bottom. We have what looks like to be a shale at the bottom, then a sandstone, then a limestone. Look on top of that limestone. You see a very irregular surface. In this case, it looks like a surface of erosion. And then deposition continued. Looks like we have another type of sand, and then we have a shale on top. That surface that separates the parallel carbonate or limestone below and the upper uh, sandstone above is a disconformity. In the field, we have some geologists investigating um, rock strata. We have Mississippian rocks on the bottom and Jurassic rocks on the top. So that surface that separates the Jurassic and the Mississippian rocks is a disconformity. It separates parallel sedimentary rock layers. Missing time. There's a lot of time between the Mississippian, which is a Paleozoic period, and the Jurassic, which is a Mesozoic period. Missing time. Whoops, went too far on that one. Let's go back. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh. It's being difficult. Okay, the second type of unconformity is the one that's easiest to recognize in the field. This is an angular unconformity. Again, we're only looking at sedimentary rocks. Let me stress that. Um, with angular and disconformities, only sedimentary rocks are involved. An angular unconformity has an erosional surface on top of tilted or folded sedimentary rocks and then younger rock or younger strata are deposited. So if we take a look at that in a block diagram, this is what we see. Look at those tilted rock layers. We have um, what looks to be um, limestone, shales, I'm not sure what they're trying to depict there in that funny one, uh, and some uh, sandstone. And then we have an erosional surface. Look at the erosional surface. On top of the erosional surface, we have deposition of carbonate rocks. So that surface that separates the tilted beds at the bottom and the parallel sedimentary bed on top is an angular unconformity. Here is a famous angular unconformity at Sicker Point in Scotland. This is what James Hutton observed in order to get his a construct of what became known as uniformitarianism that the earth had to be really really old because the depositional processes that were depositing sediments today took a long time to get these layers and then these layers in this angular unconformity had to be lithified compacted and cemented together they had to be uplifted and tilted and eroded and then um, it, they were submerged again and these younger layers on top were then deposited. This is an angular unconformity because we are looking at tilted beds below and the parallel beds on top. And last but not least we have what is called a non-conformity. Uh, a non-conformity is an erosional surface that's cut into igneous or metamorphic rocks it is overlain by sedimentary rocks. So in this case we're actually looking at other rock types other than just sedimentary rocks as opposed to the angular unconformity and disconformity that only deal with sedimentary rocks. With a nonconformity we're looking at an erosional surface cut into igneous or metamorphic rocks. We are not looking at an igneous intrusion. We have to have an erosional surface. We have to have missing time, that hiatus. So in this diagram you can see that there was an igneous body. It looks like granite down there. Um, and there there was an erosional surface. We can see an irregular surface. We do not see a metamorpho zone on top of that igneous rock, so it wasn't an intrusion. Instead, we see different um, pieces of that 
granite at the bottom that have now been incorporated in a sandstone layer above it. So this is not an intrusion. It was exposed, it was weathered, um, pieces of the rock were then incorporated into the younger sediments that were then deposited on top and we see sand and shale and limestone overlying that original eroded granite surface. So this is known as a non-conformity. Only non-conformities involve rock types other than sedimentary rocks. There's our non-conformity. Okay, in the field, um, here's a great example where we have Precambrian uh, metamorphic rocks that are down below and we have sedimentary rocks that are deposited above. It Again, it is not a, um, an intrusion. There's no bake zone. The Precambrian is anything older than you know 542 million years, and the Paleozoic sedimentary rocks are going to be younger than that. And depending on what in which period they were deposited, there can be quite a gap there of several hundreds of millions of years. And there's the surface. The surface, again, is the non-conformity. It separates, in this case, the older metamorphic rocks from the younger uh, Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. Now, as we move across a landscape, um, these unconformities, these UCs, can change regionally. For example, um, let's take a look at, I have uh, one, two, and three mark there for you. In one, we have um, sedimentary layers. There is an erosional surface and they are overlain by more sedimentary layers. What do you suspect is going on there? If you said disconformity, you're right because those beds at that point at one are essentially parallel. The uh, disconformity is the surface that separates the parallel sedimentary beds below from the parallel sedimentary beds above. Now let's move toward the right hand side of the diagram and we see that there has been some folding of those older rock layers and there is an erosional surface on top of those earlier rock layers and now they are overlain by parallel sedimentary rocks. What's going on at two? That one should be easy. That's an angular unconformity. We're looking at tilted sedimentary beds below the surface of the unconformity and we're looking at parallel sedimentary beds above. So that's an angular unconformity. Now move all the way over to the right and we see um, igneous rock it, there's no bake zone, so we're not assuming um, an emplacement um, of an igneous intrusion. Instead, this igneous rock was eroded away uh, at the top, and um, then we had the parallel sedimentary bed deposition. So what's going on at three? That's a nonconformity because it involves rock types other than sedimentary. So again, even though we're looking at rock layers across a landscape, the unconformities can change. We can have um, parallel rock layers that move, then move into an angular folded rock layers that have been eroded so that will give us an angular unconformity. If we have any igneous or metamorphic rock that has been exposed um, and weathered non-deposition before we get new deposition of sediments then in that case we're going to get a non-conformity. Okay. We use relative age dating methods for stratigraphic correlation and what this does is trace rock units of the same age across different areas. Now we can do this with surface correlation if the rocks are exposed at the surface. We can also take logs from uh, wells. We can also have cores that show us the different rock layers below the subsurface and we can use fossils. In particular, microfossils are really, really good when we're looking at cores that were taken from the subsurface. So basically what we're doing is using these fossils and using these rock types and rock layers to take rock units of similar age across the landscape and that is stratigraphic correlation. In this diagram we're using fossils. Let's move now to the different frame of reference or absolute age dating. Again we use both relative and absolute age dating time frames, time references 
to develop the geologic time scale. Absolute age dating will let us pinpoint with an age, years before the present, a rock layer or an event. So we do get an error factor. The error factor is based on the precision of the instrument we're using. It doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing, but it gives us um, basically a, a, pr a precision measurement of how close we're getting to what um, we have determined the age to be. But we are getting years before the present and we're assigning an age to the event or to the rock layer. Most commonly, we look at radiometric dating as the method to give us an absolute age on these rocks or these events. Um, we'll look at a couple of other absolute age dating methods a little bit later in this lecture, but by far the most common is radiometric dating. And this was not available uh, until the Curies discovered radioactivity, so we're not looking at absolute dating of rocks until the 1900s. So relative methods were used well back in the 1800s and it wasn't until we had radiometric techniques that we were able to assign these radiometric dates, these absolute dates, um, as we were able to date different events and types of rocks. And we'll get into the types of rocks that can be dated radiometrically in just a minute. This works because radioactive elements will spontaneously decay to a more stable element. The nucleus is unstable. We're not talking about the electrons in the outer shells, but the nucleus is unstable, and so it wants the, uh, that makes it sound like the, the atom actually has a mind of its own, but the atom is moving towards stability, so it is going to decay to become a more stable element. The unstable radioactive elements or the isotopes are called the parent, the parents. <laughs> my, my kids love this. And they change over time into stable products known as daughters. So the parent is the unstable, I have to laugh every time I think of that because my daughters just love this. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the radioactive element is unstable parent and the more stable daughter product is what we get after radioactive decay. It's, it's becoming um, more stable. Now the time it takes to do this is the half-life. Um, the time for one half of the parent to change to the daughter is known as a half-life. And the half-life is unique and it's constant for a particular radioactive pair. So in other words, the parent has a unique and constant half-life in which it decays to its daughter product. Now what type of decay are we talking about? This is not a simple arithmetic progression. After one half-life, the ratio of the parent to the total product, the daughter um, and the parent, is one half, or one over two. So let's put this in a table form. If we look at the number of half-lives that have passed, and the ratio of the parent to the parent plus daughter. After one half-life, one half of the parent will have decayed to the daughter. So now we have one part parent and one part daughter, or one part parent to the total of parent and daughter is two. Does that make sense? Okay, now we have only one half of the parent that remains. So after two half-lives, we divide up half of the half, and we end up with a ratio of one to four. So half of the remaining parent, which is half of the total now, will then undergo further decay so that what's left after two half-lives is a ratio of one to four. What happens after three? Well now we only have one-fourth of the parent represented in the total number of atoms. Only one-fourth. But after three half-lives, half of that fourth will decay to the stable daughter, so we end up with, guess what? One over eight of the original parent left in the total number of atoms. If we go to four half-lives, again we take the remaining one-eighth parent half of it decays, so now 
after four half-lives, we end up with 1 over 16. Now, if we want to look at n number of half-lives, we look at 1 over 2 to the n. So we're looking at a geometric progression, an exponential progression for decay. After one half-life, the ratio of parent to total is one half. After two half-lives, we're looking at one to four. Three half-lives, one to eight. Four half-lives, one to 16. Five half-lives, one to 32. We have different types of decay. Not all decay is the same. If an unstable parent undergoes what is known as alpha decay. It loses a helium nucleus. A helium nucleus is expelled from uh, the nucleus of the atom. A helium nucleus, if you look back on the periodic table, is composed of two protons and two ne neutrons. So uh, two protons and two neutrons are ejected from the nucleus in order for the parent to become more stable. There is also something known as beta decay. In beta decay, we're losing an electron. Now again, we're not talking about electrons in the outer shells because if we lose or gain electrons in the outer shells of the atom, we're looking at um, ionization or we have different charged particles. But instead, with beta decay, this is occurring in the nucleus, so an electron is being expelled from the nucleus. Essentially a neutron is composed of an electron and a proton. So if that neutron ejects out an electron, it now is converted to a proton and we actually get an increase in the atomic number of one. Okay, so we're gaining a proton. Um, if we go back to alpha decay, if we lose two protons, we're losing um, two on the atomic number. So again, we get a new element because we're changing the atomic number. It's going down by two with alpha decay. It's increasing by one in beta decay. And a third type we're going to consider is something called electron capture. Um, in electron capture, we gain an electron. Again, this isn't ionization. It's not that we become a, a negative ion now, by getting an electron. This involves capture of an electron by a proton in the nucleus. So the proton and the electron will combine to form a neutron. And again, we're changing the atomic number. Where we once had a proton, we now have a neutron. So we're moving down by one uh, with that atomic number of the daughter. Whoops. I have a quick touch computer today. Okay, here we have a diagram that shows alpha particle emission. Note that the two protons and two neutrons are being expelled in an alpha decay up at the top. Beta particle emission, we're losing that electron and we are essentially throwing out the electron from a neutron, so we're one proton more now in the daughter nucleus. With electron capture, we're pulling in an electron, and that is combining with an existing proton in the nucleus to form a daughter nucleus that is um, now one less than the atomic number of the parent. So, we have different types of radioactive elements that undergo decay, and I'm only going to mention uh, really two classic ones. There are many, many more, but the half-life is unique and constant for, for the pairs of radioactive parent daughters. For uranium-238, um, uranium-238 is radioactive and unstable. It will decay to lead 2000, uh, 206, excuse me and it will have a half-life of 4.5 billion years. So we're looking at using uranium-238 to only date events that are pretty darn um pretty darn old. 4.5 billion years of course is is pretty close to the age of our planet. The potassium argon pair, uh, potassium 40, is radioactive and it will spontaneously decay to the stable daughter product, which is argon 40. Um, its half life is 1.3 billion years. Uh, what's the problem with this one, though? What's the problem with this pair? What's argon? If you remember from your periodic table, argon is a gas. It is a, it's a noble gas and therefore we have to be careful when we use potassium argon to make sure that the system is closed and that gas has not escaped 
from the rocks. If it's escaped from the rocks, we're going to get a date that's much younger than what we should see. In other words, we should have more daughter product in there, which would indicate an older rock, but instead it's escaped. The argon has escaped, so we get a date that's far too young for that rock. Um, I put carbon-14 in here, but carbon-14 isn't classic uh, radiometric decay, and we'll take a look at that in just a couple of slides. But carbon-14 is being used to date more recent events. Uh, carbon-14 will spontaneously decay to nitrogen-14 after the death of an organism, and its half-life is about 5,730 years. So the time reference is, is much, much less, or we're looking at um, events that didn't occur that long ago in Earth's history. Here is a decay curve. It shows you the mineral at the time of crystallization up at the top where you have a hundred percent parent. Notice all those little black dots. And then as we move down to uh, one half-life we're losing um, 50 percent of our parent. It has been converted to more stable daughter and now we have half of those black dots being shown as red daughters. Okay, after another half-life, half of the remaining parent will decay to stable daughter, and you can see that only 25% of the parent is left. Let's take it one step further. Now we only have 12.5% of the remaining parent, um, and this occurs after three half-lives. So we're looking at an exponential progression or an exponential decay. Well, as promised, here is the diagram for um, our carbon and um, our nitrogen. What happens is that nitrogen-14 uh, through neutron capture will form carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere. And carbon-14 is absorbed along with the other forms of carbon. Uh, carbon-12 is the most common uh, isotope, and it will be incorporated into organisms that are growing, such as trees, and we see, you know, a grazing animal. But what happens after the death of the uh, living organism is that we get decay. That carbon-14 that was incorporated will now slowly decay um, into nitrogen-14. So we can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 to see how old um, or how long it's been since that organism has died. Again, that half-life is constant and it's unique. What other um, absolute age dating methods do we have? Dendrochronology is tree ring dating. Um, that can be used, but it can only bring us back a couple of hundred thousand years, so we use radiometric dating much more commonly, especially for um, rock events and rock layers that are millions of years old. Fission track dating is, um, is relatively recent, and what we do with fission track dating is we etch a mineral and see the tracks from uranium decay. Basically, as these, um, these particles have been expelled from the nucleus during the half-life, we can see the tracks moving across the mineral, and I'll show you a picture of that. Dendrochronology, um, the way that this works, tree rings will reflect climatic conditions so in times of drought we get uh, tree rings that are very very narrow and they can be correlated with other tree rings it doesn't necessarily have to be from the same tree so you can see in this diagram we have an overlapping set of trees uh, our boards or beams cut from these trees and we're able to bring back um, the date quite substantially. We're moving from the um, the 19, oh gosh, that looks like about the 1950s, I guess, all the way back into the 1840s. So we can, depending on what's available and certain events that we know were very stressful and how we've pinpointed an age, we can use dendrochronology to come back uh, quite a ways, but there are limitations. And of course, we need trees. Not as common as radiometric dating. Uh, here are some little uh, fission tracks that can be used to date. Uh, they can, uh, scientists count these fission tracks and are able to determine the age of the mineral through the number of fission tracks. Now, we can combine relative and absolute dating methods to get um, a more precise understanding of the rock record. We know through 
the um, principle of superposition that the older layers are on the bottom. Um, that batholith, of course, uh, we're assuming in this diagram was not an intrusion, but instead we have a non-conformity on top of that batholith because we don't have a baked zone. The batholith can be dated at 180 million years ago, and that dike running through the batholith and all the sedimentary layers on top is 150 million years. And what can we say about the sedimentary rocks? Well, we know that they're on top of the batholith, so that they have to be younger than 180 million years, right? Because that's superposition and we have a nonconformity, not an intrusion. But the dike is an intrusion and we have 150 million years from the present as the date on that dike. So because that dike cuts across those sedimentary layers, the principle of cross-cutting relationships, we know that those sedimentary layers are older than the dike that cuts across them. So we can say that those layers on top of that batholith are somewhere between 180 and 150 million years ago. They were deposited uh, between 180 and 150 million years ago. Here we have um, a, have an arrow that will point to whoops sorry about that to a, an ash layer and the ash layer is a volcanic ash layer which can be dated it's between layers of shallow marine limestone and using uranium lead we find out that the ash is 453.7 million years old. So what can we say about the age of the limestone? Well, with the principle of superposition, we know that the limestone below that ash layer is going to be older than 453.7 million years. We can also say that the limestone above the ash layer is younger by principle of superposition. It's younger than 453.7 million years old. Now, one thing you're probably noticing at this point, we are dating volcanic ash layers and igneous rock intrusions, but we're not dating sedimentary rocks. And there's a reason for that. Sedimentary rocks are incorporating pieces of existing rocks. So if we try to date a sedimentary rock, we're not getting the age of formation of the sedimentary rock. We're getting the age of formation of that original igneous little detritus that was formed as the rock cooled. So we're dating the age of the particle inside the sedimentary rock, but we're not dating the formation of the rock. It is difficult to date sedimentary rocks. Again, sedimentary rocks are difficult to date. There is an exception. There is a mineral, a clay mineral known as glauconite. Um, it incorporates potassium in its formation and can be dated using the potassium argon method. However, argon is a gas, so you have to be careful that the system is closed or you're going to get the wrong date for glauconite. Index fossils can be much more reliable and give us a much more complete record for the geologic time scale. So although radiometric dating has enabled us to pinpoint precise events, um, fossils and the limited time span of different organisms can be much more reliable when we're looking at sedimentary rocks. Now what I'd like to close with um, oops, sorry about that. Radiometric dates were added later for the um, geologic time scale, and as noted, that we didn't even know about the science of radioactivity until uh, the Curies discovered radioactivity, or radioactivity discovered them, however you want to look at that. Um, but it has been very, very important in the geologic time scale because that half-life is unique and constant for the different parent-daughter pairs. So it does enable us to pinpoint exact dates for certain events in the um, geologic age of the Earth. Okay, the last thing I want to look at in this lecture are units. Um, we have different ways of discussing time, rocks, and what are known as time rock units in geology and I'd like to give you a brief overview of that because you're probably uh, seeing it already if you haven't already or if you won't see it uh, sometime in the future I guarantee you you will see it in the future especially in uh, historical geology earth history 
Okay, if we're looking at rock units, if we're looking at lithostratigraphic units, uh, litho meaning rock, um, we divide up rock units on the basis of formations, and that's outlined in red because it is the most common, it is the base rock unit that we use um, out in the field. We can break formations down into members, smaller units, and members we can break further down into beds. Um, groups of formations will form a group, and a group of groups will form a supergroup. But by far the most common unit and the base unit for uh, lithostratigraphic units is the formation. Now this is the um, some rocks of the Grand Canyon, and you'll note that the Chinle Formation right there is, is a formation, but um, look right above to the left of that circle, and you'll see the Springdale Sandstone Member. So we can break down that Chinle Formation into members. We can further break down members into beds, and this makes it a little bit easier to communicate uh, sometimes when we're trying to get information across to other geologists about precise uh, individual beds in a certain area. Now we also have time units and time rock units. Um, time units, geologic time scale, the basic unit that we use is the period. We can divide periods up into epochs and epochs into ages. Um, a group of periods will form an era. And the biggest time unit we have is an eon. So eons are broken down into eras. Eras are broken down into periods. Period is the base unit, the most common un unit that we, um, we utilize. Periods are broken into epochs, and epochs are broken into ages. Time rock units are rocks that are deposited during specific intervals of time. So we're combining um, chronostratigraphic or time and lithostratigraphic and rock into a chronolithostratigraphic unit or a time rock unit. The rocks that are deposited during an eon are known as an eonothem. Sometimes that's just uh, eon them. I've seen it both ways. Um, the rocks deposited during an era or an erythem. The rocks deposited during a period are referred to as a system. And this is the basic unit, time rock unit, that we use. The rocks deposited during an epoch are known as a series. And the rocks deposited during an age are known as a stage. Okay, that will complete our discussion today on geologic time. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them on your discussion board or email your instructor. This is just a brief overview in Earth history in the Teachers in Geosciences program. We get into a lot more detail with geologic time. We investigate the different eons as well as the different eras and periods of the Earth and look at the evidence um, for each of these and how the Earth has progressed in both life forms and in landforms. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.